And I did mention that we're going to have a special guest in the studio today. And um, yes, he is here. And that's distinguished Senator Gabriel Siswam. Welcome to the show, sir. Thank you very much. Great to have you here, sir. And um, we're living in very peculiar times. So we do have a lot to talk about when it comes to Nigeria and um, the affairs of the country. Yeah, also the... Um, chairman for the Senate Committee on Power. So we'll talk about you know, what's happening there as well because you have had several issues coming up in the power sector of recent. So we're going to be looking at that. But first, I just um, also want to pay my condolences. Um, one of your members just died. And um, you know, my condolences to you. Thank you very the much. The ninth yeah. senator has not had it easy. A very nice gentleman. Uh, yeah. yeah, I mean... You've had four members in one yeah, year. Yeah, it's, um, it's I think um, since the history of uh, the Senate since 1999, this is the first time that within a span of one year you have about four senators dying. And so it's, it's, that, that it's, it's is awesome. very sad. We hope and pray that it doesn't that, 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 that's what it stops at, right? Yeah. <laughs> we're, we're hoping, you know, I'm praying about that as well. And, um, and just an overview before we delve into the issues. It's been one year yeah. since the ninth Senate resumed. Um, what, what, how would you categorize your one year as being? What would you say uh, the one year has been like for the ninth Senate? Well, let me first thank you very much for the opportunity to at least uh, let Nigeria know what we do at the Senate because there's a lot of misconception out there about the National Assembly. All you hear about is how much money they're making. Yes. People are not interested in actually um, taking a critical look at some of the legislation that we we are, we are churning out for um, the interests of the Nigerian people. And so for the past one year, uh, when we came in, uh, there was an agenda that um, was read out by the uh, newly elected Senate President, then Dr. Amelaon. Um, and one of the very important thing out of that agenda was the fact that uh, he promised that this ninth Senate was going to reset uh, the budget cycle back to where it used to be from January to December. Hmm. You know, for a long period of time, budget are passed either in, in, in the June, middle of the year, uh, June, and then you can have uh, performance more than forty, at times even thirty something percent. And uh, we've been able to achieve that. For the first time, the budget was passed in December before we left for Christmas. And they started implementation right from January. I think it's a major milestone. And uh, people don't want to listen to that. They, they don't know that the Senate did quite a lot. Because it took a lot hmm. for us to do that. To be able to synergize with the executive. Uh, executive, for them to bring the budget on time, for us to pass it on time and scrutinize it properly. I think that is very major. Hmm. Um, aside from that, um, he also promised that the Senate was going to make sure that the issue of epileptic power supply, we're going to look into it. And that is what we've been doing uh, since I became the chairman, we've had a roundtable, pull all the stakeholders in the power sector together to discuss that. And as I talk to you, I'm doing an investigation. I'm investigating the entire power sector hmm. as it relates... The privatization. To, yeah, as it relates to the uh, interventions uh, from the uh, federal government into the privatized uh, power sector. So these are measures that are intended uh, to... Uh, for us to assess what is going on there and then come hmm. up with how we can move forward in the power sector. I'm just mentioning this. An overview of the things that have and, been and done. And then if we look at the bills that we've passed since then, we've, we, we, we've taken actions in the area of security. There was a security um, um, uh, meeting as well, you know, that the Senate uh, took some very major decision as it relates to the security situation in the country. And um, I think that some of the things that are going on right now within the security ar architecture in the country are based on some of the outcomes from what the Senate did. So uh, just to mention a few, there are oh. a host of other things that uh, we're doing, a lot of motions addressing immediately 
the issues that touches and concerns all Nigerians. Nigerians. And, mm. and so I think the Nice Senate is on track. We're doing very well. Uh, lots of people might not agree with me, but then um, from, from my own uh, perspective, I, I think we've done very well. And I mean, uh, you also have this issue of coronavirus pandemic that is some sort of contraction for every yeah, everybody for basically yeah, yeah. Um, so so the Senate has also, also had to deal deal with that Let, let's talk about that for a minute I know that the Senate is, is temporarily shot because you're doing this infection and all that uh, when yeah, do you think we're, you're we're, going we're, to resume we're not again shot per se. what we did was that we when it started around March uh, there was this fear in the minds of every person, so we we, we, we took uh, like a two weeks holiday. You know, the federal government themselves uh, say that the entire country, no Abuja, Lagos, and Ogun State, State, were completely shut down. And so, in respect to that, we also shut down for those two weeks. But what has happened, arising from some uh, very critical issues that were coming before. Uh, the, the National Assembly and we needed to address them. We decided that we will come back and we've been sitting uh, once a week to address some communications that were coming from the president. Okay. You know, there were ambassadors that needed to be appointed. Hmm. Uh, there were uh, federal character commissioners that needed to be appointed. Hmm. There were a whole lot of those issues that we needed to immediately address them. And of course, you know that arising from the pandemic, the budget needed to be reviewed and revised. Yes. Yes. And that was very important. And it's very important for the economy of the country. Absolutely. Those issues brought us back. In oh. fact, from uh, about two weeks back, we've been sitting more than once a week. But what we've done is in, 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 uh, um, in accepting or respecting the rules or regulations set by the National uh, Council for Disease Control, yes. we space the manner that we sit in the Senate. We're no longer sitting very close together. So we you mentioned like that the President has presented before the Senate um, the issue of loans to, to be approved. And the Senate has approved a number of loans for the president, for the executive. I know for a fact that, you know, the Senate president did talk about, oh, we've approved over so, so, so amount for the, for the, for the executive and um, saying that, well, because of COVID-19, all prices have plunged. There is no way to fund the budgets and finance infrastructure. And that's why all of this is happening. You are a member of the opposition party. Um, your candidate for the 2019 presidential election, that's former Vice President Atuk Bakar, he actually wrote an op-ed about this, talking about the debt and talking about how much debt, uh, you know, this government is plunging Nigerians into. It will extend to um, the future generations. You were part of the Senate that approved this loan. I want to get your thoughts specifically on the issue of the loan. Uh, yeah, if I say that I'm not worried at the rate of, um, of, of the loans that are being collected, I'll be telling lies. But I will say that the reality on ground is that the country needs to move forward. The, 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 the economies of even developed countries have contracted yes. badly. Yes. And um, a lot of, 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 of developed economies, for instance, like America, where they have money, they have embarked on stimulus to, to, to companies. Yes. yes. What that means is that America as a country is also printing money. Now, we have an economy where we're not producing anything. So our economy is more dependent than a developed economy. And when you find yourself hmm. in a circumstance such as this, there's no option than to borrow. You know, if we say we'll not borrow, it means that everything will become stagnant completely. Now, you have a budget where, you know, you are provided uh, for funding infrastructures, and whether they're physical or social, and then suddenly, some uh, unanticipated you now have a situation where everything is gone down. Yes. Everything. We we had projected our budget uh, at, at fifty seven dollars uh, per per barrel. Now the oil went down at some point below twenty. Yes. So um, most of the monies that we're going to fund the budget with are going to come from that source mm. of revenue. What do you do? Now it's, it's been moving back gradually but it's not enough. Yeah. So we needed to restructure the entire budget and then 
the need for borrowing comes in. I'm worried, yes. Every Nigerian should be worried about that because uh, payment back becomes a problem. But if we look at the reality of the situation, any person, even if I was president, I would have no option than to borrow. And so for me, it's not about being opposition. It's about the reality of, this, of the situation that we found ourselves in. A lot of countries, even America is the most borrowed economy in the world. They are, and they are the richest too, aside from China. But they have borrowed so much. And so the problem here is the ability and the capacity to pay back. And what the money is used for. And what the money is used for. Those are worrisome. And those issues were raised on the floor of the Senate. Some issues of spending about $500 million on NTA was a very major concern to senators, not just senators in opposition, across, across the, uh, the broad spectrum of senators. Hmm. This, those were issues that um, we raised on the floor. But the fact of the matter and the reality is that even if I become president today and found myself in that in situation, situation, I would need to borrow. Borrowing, prudently applied, is not a problem. But when you borrow and apply it on items that will not be able to repair back, then it becomes a problem. What we need to do, like the borrowing in the power sector, most of the, some of the monies that are going to be applied in the power sector are recoverable. And also for us to become a productive economy, engage in manufacturing and all of that, we need to spend a lot of money in the power sector. That one is not a problem, but there are some items there that I problem actually. I think that arising from uh, uh, the complaints from the National Assembly, uh, they are going to look at some of these areas. So for me, yes, it's a problem, but what is the reality? When you face a reality, it's different from when you're so you sitting have to outside. Deal with it. You have to deal with it. It's different from somebody who's sitting on the sideline. That line. doesn't have all the information. It's like playing football. You are, you are just uh -huh. you and the goalkeeper, and the person outside sees all the chances of scoring, but you who is on the feed are not seeing those chances. True. That is the situation that you find the True. president in. True. So I think that the president, what he's trying to do, is to uh, keep the economy running. Uh, how does he do that? He has to borrow. So now let, let's talk about, um, you know, some of the things that, because yeah, we're going to talk about power. Yeah. Uh, you, you're carrying out investigations. About 1.8 trillion is said to have been spent, yeah. you know, on yeah. that. So discourse came out to say, we've only gotten 52 billion. Where are you getting 1.8 trillion from? That's what they said. And then, um, you know, you have the d different conversations about whether that discourse wouldn't have the capacity to carry on this job because by the time you look at what has been generated and what has been transmitted and what has been distributed, there's a lot of disparity there. So, I mean, your Senate, you, you know, you called for a review of the entire privatization uh, thing that happened back in 2013. Okay, there are legal issues to contend with if you're ever going to embark on that. But I want to get your your total, your, your comments on the issue of the privatization and all of this monies that are being spent. Because if there are private companies, like the Senate did say, your Senate, <coughs> why are they getting so much money, you know, from government why are we funding them let's talk about that yeah let me put the record straight the senate didn't say that um, uh, they should go back on privatization um, the president of the senate uh, out of frustration uh, alluded to that but he didn't say that um, we don't believe in the privatization there are issues and these are very fundamental issues that need to be addressed now um, what is happening in the power sector it's unfortunate uh, because the privatization itself was premised on faulty ground. Because uh, mm. there, 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 are, there are three theories of privatization. One is a big bank uh, theory. That is, you privatize everything in the power sector from generation to transmission to distribution. Uh, to distribution. Then there is the second one, which is that you privatize only distribution. There's a third one, which will privatize only generation. What we did was copying, a, what you say, copy and paste. What British and West did, that they had the capacity 
to privatize using the first theory of big bang theory where you privatize everything, everything. at the same time hmm. we didn't have that capacity and so we went into the big bang theory of privatization which is privatize everything now we're contending with issues that it's difficult to get out of them now you privatize generation 100 percent you privatize uh, distribution 60 percent um, at some point, you know that uh, transmission was also concession to Manitoba, a Canadian decision. Yes. Which, and, and you know, most countries don't tamper with transmission because it borders on the security of the country. Yes. Let's talk about the privatization. Some of the parameters that were set at that time were 40 parameters. And arising from that, there were submission from potential investors investor based on 40 parameters. And that is what has created the problem. Now, we we are deep into it, and there's nowhere in the world, because power is a public service. Yes. It's for public service. Now, everywhere in the world, in America, power is subsidized by the government. The subsidy here seems to be high, because like I said, uh, the, the, the wrong premise upon which privatization was carried out is what has enhanced the uh, the, the hugomous amount of money that, that you see people are, com- that, that are complaining about. But let's 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 even talk about the money. The first money that was given to the power sector was 213 billion for, by the central bank for, for intervention. This part of that money, about 60 percent of that money, went to legacy debt. There were legacy debt. What you call legacy debt are debt that were incurred yeah. pre-privatization. Yes. That money was meant to settle some of this debt. There are liabilities of, of gas suppliers. There were liabilities of workers and all, all kind of liabilities. Part of that money, the first money went not to Jenkos. Out of that entire money of 200 and, and, uh, and 10 or 14 billion, Jenko got a very small percentage of that money. The entire, most of the money went to uh, gas suppliers, to Jenkos, and to other legacy debt. Let's take the 701 billion. 701 billion. You have a situation where <clears throat> the discos are not allowed to charge what they call cost reflective tariff. That is tariff that is, is tariffs with the cost of production yes. of power. They're not allowed to charge it. For instance, cost reflective tariff, I'm just giving an example, 50 naira, right? And you're allowed to charge 30. That means there's a deficit of, of 20. 20. Yeah. Now, that is what the government is paying. That money is not going to any disco or anything. Most of that money, virtually all of it is going to Jenkos because they are the, gener- they are the one generating Generation, power. Yes. Now, if a Jenko generates, for instance, 23 megawatts, right? There's a buck trader called Embed. Embed buys that power. The Jenkos invoice Embed to the tune of 23 megawatts. Maybe that light, that, that electricity generator is coming to Abuja, yeah. uh, Abuja distribution, for instance. It invoices Embed to the tune of 7 billion, right? Now, gen- discos are expected. Embed in turn sell that light to Abuja distribution and pass on that invoice to Abuja distribution. You have a situation where you are expected for you to pay that invoice. You are expected to charge cost reflective tariff yes. of 50. You are allowed to charge only 30. So there's a deficit of 20. So all these monies are going to Jenkos and not to distribution. And there are monies that are paying for debt. So it's not money that is we hands any so, so hands generation are, are you, or distribution yes. or transmission. So are you are you um you know with the discos when they say that they have a liquidity problem and they've not really no. been getting money? See, virtually all the discos are insolvent. There's a liquidity problem. And that is why we've decided there are a lot of uh, conversation and discussion going on. I'm aware that uh, the CBN Minister of Finance and some of the major stakeholders are holding a series of meetings. In the National Assembly, right now, we're investigating why so much money has been expended. And there's no increase in generation. There's no improvement in in delivery of of electricity to Nigerians. And what we're discovering is that this money is not put into enhancing or looking at the infrastructure because we need to look at the infrastructure. 
But okay, doesn't, isn't, it, isn't that where Siemens comes in? Because in the, the Siemens, no, before is, Siemens, you know, Siemens is a long term thing because even if the contract is eventually signed, it's not yet signed. Even if the contract is eventually signed, it's going to take 18 months before you begin to see any, any, sort, of any sort of improvement. Now, there are monies that the federal government have borrowed that are in the kitty already. And those monies will be used in addressing some of this infrastructural deficit. So that if, uh, for instance, the installed capacity for generation for this country for now is about 13,000 megawatts. Yes. The transition came and told us that is the one that we, the power, to all the distribution company told us that they can wheel about 8,300 but we've been told consistently that it's about 7,000. They have not had the capacity to wheel beyond 5,000. So what that in effect means is that our capacity for the wheeling capacity for transmission company is about 5,000 and even that 5,000 is what you call technical losses along the line. When you take off these technical losses, it comes to about 4,000. And, and, and they're also something. saying distributors can't carry more than um, less, about 3,000. That has been the controversy between distributors and transmission companies. And when you call transmission, they say, look, transmission is unable to weigh this power. Transmission said, look, we, have, we can weigh this, but distribution are not. So it, did, it has to... So there's a blame game going no, on, really. It, it revolves around the issue of infrastructure deficit in the power sector. Okay. That is the problem. Infrastructure deficit is in the power sector. When it was privatized, the expectation was that those private entities will now pull in money, invest in more in money, the gap of the infrastructure. and improved... The, the, the infrastructure in the power sector. None of them have been able to do that. And so that is where we are. But the government is working around it. You know, if we look at the privatization in India, India were a bit uh, smarter than us. And they tried to start with generation, uh, no, with distribution. It generated a lot of problems because you now have farmers who uh, were uh, complaining very loudly that they are increasing tariff they can't afford it because in farming you need long-term investment and all of that so it's a big problem there's nowhere i've studied about five developing economies where this privatization has taken place there's no one that has no problem if it is mexico the problem if it is brazil those ones their generation capacity is even more than that they're far better than us but they're contending with the same problem that we're contending with unfortunately for us here we use the bank the big bank theory we would have started probably with generation phase see how it works just do it in phases uh, we we'll do it in phases unfortunately we started boom and so the problems are compounded now every person's hand is on deck national assembly the executive all of us are sitting on the round table trying to find a way around it i've been holding a series of meetings with different people yesterday I had a very comprehensive meeting with the Minister of Finance. I had a meeting with NEC. NEC is the regulator of yes, the sector. Yes, and let, yes. Let's talk about NEC because we know that tariff increases are coming up. I mean, that is something that every Nigerian is concerned about, especially because we know that, we, I mean, you don't get the power and then the, the tariff is increased. But we also know that the discos need to charge because they like what is actually supposed to be charged, like you said. But I know that the Senate did call on, uh, call on the federal government to pause on that because of the COVID-19 issue. But it does look like that's not going to happen now. They're going ahead with it on the 1st of July. What are your thoughts on that? You know, the, the, the tariff increase was supposed to kick in uh, from April. April. Uh, that was delayed because of the covid but you can't ask, the more you delay, within those months, we've lost about 98 billion. And so if we continue to delay it, the power sector will continue to go down because liquidity will continue, will continue to, to become be a, a, problem. a problem and an issue. Hmm. Now, yes, all of us are concerned. I'm concerned that there is going to, they are going to activate tariff increase uh, first of uh, first of July. And those were the meetings that we've been holding. What do we do? How do we go around it? But they've come up with a strategy which they're working on. Uh, it's not yet uh, fully ready, but by July it will be ready. Where they're now saying it's not cost reflective, but it's service reflective. Okay. Now, what what does that mean? For instance, for people who will be having 20, 20 hour supply of electricity. You get to pay more you, because. You get to pay more. Your service For more. instance, for somebody who lives in Asokoro, who has 20 hours of electricity and somebody who lives 
in for instance in, in Maraba who has maybe about eight hours you can't you can't charge you, them you, the you same can't thing. charge them the same thing okay so they're allowing the discourse to look at that within their areas of jurisdiction and 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 then segment the, 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 the tariff increase. Of course, if I live in Metama and I have 20, 20 hours of electricity, my tariff will go up proportionate to, 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 the, the, hours, you, uh, to, to the hours get. that I get. Somebody who lives in Yanya who have four hours, for instance, cannot be paying the same rate as I'm paying. So they've allowed them move move away from cost-reflective tariff to sorry, service service-reflective reflective. tariff. Okay. And I think that we uh, resonate with most Nigerians. The worry is that we're going to have boom increase in, 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 in tariff of electricity. No. It's going to be segmented depending on how many hours. And that will allow the discourse to engage customers. Hmm. And if you say that you are charging me in this because I'm giving you 10 hours and we we'll discover the regulator discover that you are giving those people six hours. Of course, you are going to refund them what the excess oh, that you charge. Nice. So it's very technical, but it's, it's workable and to. it's doable. And so we are giving them uh, the benefit of so that. The hoping that, uh, that. Uh, mm. uh, down the road, the sector will become liquid and then tariff itself will become will begin to go down. Mm. Okay, so I mean, I, I like the fact that we'll be able to talk about power very extensively because it is one of the biggest problems that Nigeria has been facing for decades, you know. <laughs> now, let, let's talk about um, insecurity, right? Insecurity has been very rife. Uh, you represent Benway State. You were the former governor for Benway State. The insecurity in Benway State, I mean, I think it was just a few days ago there was still news about, you know, um, killings and, and um, clashes, you know, uh, the president had a meeting with the service chiefs two days ago, and he was saying that, you know, they had to do something, that their best doesn't seem to be good enough, they have to get get on it. The Senate has called on the president in the past to just fire these people and get more people and get new people in there because they've been there for five years. Um, is that good enough for you, his decision right now on that, that they have to, yeah, he, he spoke very tough. Is that good enough for you? Well, uh, I think Nigerians um, are, are disgruntled as far as the security situation is concerned because uh, without security, nothing can happen. And uh, uh, I think that um, there's a need uh, for the federal government to be more serious than they are now because this, are re, this is re. People are being killed like chicken every day. And uh, when you... Are sworn in to hold an executive office. You swore to an oath to protect lives and property of the people that you are representing. And once you are unable to protect lives and property, then there's a challenge there. And where we found ourselves now, it's very clear that that oath which we swore that will protect lives and properties of Nigerians were unable to do it. And so what do we do? I think that uh, the president should, um, you know, uh, be more proactive. Those service chiefs have not given us any result. They have not. And so the other people, once you try this, it doesn't work. You try this one. You keep the same people because they're using the same strategy. If you keep them there for 10 years, they have, long, they have run out of ideas. And so what we need is to have new hands there. And let us see whether they will introduce new strategies for us to uh, uh, to address the security challenge. In the Senate, we debated and came up with measures and said that the security architecture of this country needs to be rejected. And uh, that was presented, uh, I believe, to, to, to the executive. Uh, but nothing seems to have been done with uh, our Respect presentation. To that. Uh, if we don't, security is not something we joke with. Look at what is happening across the country. Bandits will go and wipe off the whole village. These are innocent poor farmers yes. in the villages. And we're elected to protect them. We're totally unable to protect them. It's very unfortunate. And I think that uh, it's not something that um, has to do with politics because it affects all of us. Sure. As governor, I confronted the issue. How did I do it? Because this issue started uh, when I was governor. But I applied myself. I was, I was in the bush most of the time by myself. I, I, I made sure that that was on the front banner on, on, the, on the issues that I was, I was uh, dealing with as governor of that state. 
because once you address security, once there is peace, people can engage in their different endeavors. And uh, investors it, can come in. Yeah, if there is no peace, nobody is coming to see. I, uh, you, for instance, now most farmers, most of uh, Benue, for instance, we are about ninety percent, basically even hundred percent farmers. Mm. Now you have people who are harassing farmers; they are not going to farm. Then farming comes in. People are going to be hungry, yeah. and a hungry man is an angry man. That is sure. why there is a spira, there is a spike, as the American will call it, in criminality, because most of these people who ordinarily would have been engaged in some legitimate activities don't have those activities, hmm. and they need to survive, so they engage in criminality. So I mean, the, the, one triggers of the other, basically. Yeah, yeah, one yeah. triggers another. That, so there is. There's a chain of events that will happen when we're unable to address the issue, the insecurity issue in the country. So I hope that with the marching orders that the president gave, I think yesterday or the day before yesterday, Two days ago, I hope yeah. one hope that there will be a difference. Uh, but, you were saying that um, you know because as governor you confronted it, you went there, you know you you, yeah, you were always there. Do you myself. think the governors right now are, are, are applying themselves enough? Well, I, I I know that for my state, I speak for my state because I know the efforts that the governor has made, how he has confronted it, you know, he ran into problem in trying to, where he was shouting about this insecurity, most people told that he was, uh, he was just a rabble rosa. Hmm. Unfortunately, it has engulfed the entire country. When my governor was talking, he was a lone voice in the wilderness. Now, other states, virtually all the states have confronted it. And so I think that as a governor, there are limitations too because the security apparatus are not within your control. Hmm. Uh, that that is what is leading to the agitation of state police, which I don't support anyway. Why don't that you support a, state that, police? That is another talk for. But another why don't day. you support? Just just very, very briefly, let's know why you don't support state police. Yeah, I don't support state police because of my fear uh, for the abuse. I, 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 you know, as governor, you think I abuse had, is not present right now. Uh, it will be at a larger scale. It will be a larger scale. As governor, I'm talking from experience because you have absolute power as governor and uh, we don't want a situation where um, not all of them, not all of them, but the few that will abuse it, that will, what will become the issue. And there will be abuse. There's no doubt about it. There's no doubt about you. you, you see so, so can't, can't can't laws be made to check that as opposed to saying let's not have it at all? Considering don't, don't the fact that, that they, don't you well, have laws? Now? I'm saying that if you're going to now do state police, you can look at laws, you know, to fit that, to make sure that the abuse can be regulated, no, especially see, with state houses a, of assembly a, it's, it's, and, and all it, that. It, 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 it's not about law; it's the efficacy of the law that is important. Are, are laws being respected in this country? Of course, no. And so, it is for us. Are we disciplined enough? Are we matured enough? You see, it's something that we must take one step after the other. We can't just say that it's okay. This is practice elsewhere, and so we should come here. You know, there were native police, uh, native authority police before. Why were they disbanded? They were disbanded because of the abuse. The abuse. Now, now people are more conscientized. People have become more impatient and they want immediate result. And so we need to look at it critically. I support community policing. Community policing is slightly different from state, state police. police. Hmm. And so community policing will start from there and then build to state police. But we can't just walk up one day and say, as governor, as a sitting governor, I oppose vehemently state police. Even when you were governor, you Even when I, it started when I was governor. I, I okay. opposed it vehemently. And I had reasons because I know that you have state police. I can decide that my mother is the commissioner of police in Benue. And you know what that means. Hmm. Do you understand what I'm saying? And okay. there's a likelihood that people will do. You know, you, you see a situation where people wanted <clears throat> their own uh, in-laws to become governors after them. People wanted their children to become senators and all of that who were who sitting governors. So different people, uh, perspectives, you know, are different. And so let us not... Just to guard against the abuse. Yeah, let us not create right a situation where this country will go into pieces because you begin to have warlords. People in the name of state police will begin to build armies against the Federation. So I don't, and I would never support state police, okay. given 
where All we are us. now, what I've seen. Hmm. Okay. Now, let, let's quickly move from there because of time, because um, I find your view very, very interesting. I would not have expected that because we were sitting governor, but, you know, it's, it's refreshing and interesting yeah. what your perspective is on this. Let's talk about the prevalent issues that we have right now, which is um, rape, sexual, gender-based violence, and the calls. It looks like it is, what it, it, you know, Nigerians are really serious about this right now. I always say that, you know, rape or sexual gender-based violence it's not getting it's not increasing it's just being spoken about more now because we have social media to amplify it and so it is getting more in the news right the senate has s sat on this had discussions about this and uh, one of the things that you know uh, was said in the senate was that we need stiffer penalties do you think it's stiffer penalties or just because what we have right now has not been applied because right now we have um, as much penalties as uh, as um, you know 25 years um, and some, you know, court, the, yeah, it's because it's a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a criminal it's offense. It's, it's, so, is it about the penalties it, or the application? It's the efficacy of the law. I've said it before. You know, it's not about penalty. It is that the 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 uh, uh, the agencies or the security agencies saddled with the responsibility are doing that work. And whether we in the country we don't. Um, like uh, you know a lady is raped and then he goes to court you know because it's a very tortuous uh, prosecution process for you to prove rape in court and so they put you under all kind of questions they question your background if you have a boyfriend as a lady they question whether you are a loose no no lady wants to go through that and so that discourages even people who Reporting. have been raped hmm. and when you are raped because of uh, of of uh, uh, setting you know even the police they don't see it as an issue you know why elsewhere you know in america they put this the, 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 in a chip they put in you so that if we go within this area in garki here every person will be alerted that there's there's a rapist around so people are more cautious you don't want to stigmatize to that level that everywhere you go there's a bell ringing bang, 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 that you are rapist here people who rape um, are protected by the same security agency who are supposed to prosecute them. So it's not about stiffer penalty. Like you say, it's about the efficacy of the law. Are they applying the law as they should apply? Because the criminal code has sufficient penalty. Yes. And the penal code so what do we do? encourage our security agency saddled with this, the police, SS, you know, to be more serious. You know, the application you think they of need the more law, training? The, yeah, the application of the law should be more serious. And then, you know, when you go to prove rape in court, because that rape was one of the very interesting topics when we went to when I was in, in, in University in of Lagos, uh, in, uh, not in law school, in, in the university, uh, because the 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 the, the, the prosecution of rape and the <laughs> to prove rape discourages uh, the victim. It discourages the victim. That's why it's not, it's not, nobody stigmatizes you. But here, if a, a lady is raped and uh, is gone to court and is all over the place, when he even comes to marriage, people are running away, say, ah, no, 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 that one. So that discourages a lot of ladies from it. We must, uh, there must be an advocacy that if somebody rapes you, that person must be punished so that it serves as a deterrent to other people in the so society. So it is, it is how to move the blame from because the victims it destroys to, a lady to who is the raped. It destroys her psychologically. Yes. And, and so it is a very serious... You see, for instance, in developed economies, rape, I think at times, is it treated more serious than even mother itself because it destroys the human being. You are just a walking... Uh, the, the, tra the trauma never goes away. Yes, it never yeah. goes away. And so we, we need to... And, I, you know, as governor, I had to um, confront that. There was an incident where a lady who just came in year one in the university was raped. And uh, it got to my knowledge we were able to arrest the guy. And then I got the family of the lady. And the mother and the father said, no, 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 no. That if we take this thing up this girl is destroyed which is true because people you know our mentality is different people will begin to stigmatize her that uh, she was the one who put herself so we have to get to the point where we also educate people about it, it has a lot to do with education with, with education, education and reorientation and of the minds of people stand. 
and say yes, this man regardless, this is it. Let's the, prove it. The entire prosecution and prove it. I, I know Benue State has domesticated uh, the Child Right Act and the yeah, BAP Act. Uh, congratulations, that's yeah. fantastic. Um, but there are states that have not domesticated it, and there are states that might not domesticate it because I just sent it to here you're, last uh, week. Uh, excuse me, let me just finish. Yeah. That said that you know if northern states would not domesticate this act because it goes against their religion uh, and so I want to know what you think about that because these are your colleagues is there something you can do in the Senate when it comes to uh, you know the Child Right Act the domestication of it or you know the VAP Act um, you know like I said it's not about the domestication of a Child Right Act it's about the efficacy of the law you know you can domesticate it and uh, nobody pays attention to it. It makes no meaning. You know, the mentality of the people need to be changed. There's a lot of advocacy that needs to be done about some of these social ease. And that is what matters. It's not about law. It's not about child right act. Yeah, no, but, but, you, but, so, but if it's not about that, why did you just say domesticated if it's not that important? No, no. You see, you see, there's this, um, we're, we're, we're in the polity of nations. And, and so, you know, when, when such things come, now it's a, the world has become a global village. Uh, this is, these are universal laws that are being applied in different countries. When you don't do it, uh, it looks like where well, this man is operating in the 16th century. Now, what we need to do is to apply the laws that exist. Well, but the, the, let, me, let me let me let me let me let me clarify something because the, just, child, the child right act itself, you know, protects protects the child, the girl child especially, you know. And um, one of the things that was said there uh, that, that you know the senator told me was that it goes against Isla uh, Islamic uh, you know rules because a girl has to be once she's matured, once she's um, once she attains puberty, she can be married off regardless of how old she is because the age is not important. Now. Now, that's something the Child Rights Act addresses. That So when you say it's not about the law, I want to understand you what you mean by it's not about court, the law. The criminal court say that if you sleep with an underage girl, you'll be punished. It's the same thing as what is in the Criminal Rights Act. The criminal court, you know that. But that what about if they say we're marrying, we're marrying her, we're not just now, sleeping now, with her? Now, you have, I don't want to go into the controversy of religion because I'm not a Muslim, so I don't know what the religion say about that, but I don't want to go into that controversy. I'm talking about the law. Criminal, criminal, the, the criminal code, the penal code, all of this addresses these issues. Because an underage girl, like you are saying, hmm. as described by the criminal code, is the same thing that is the Child Right Act. Those laws have not been applied. They have not. There are people who have raped children Nothing has happened to them. The, the police will pick them up, lock them up for, for, for a few months, and then they're out. Because the people who are supposed to come to testify for the prosecution don't want their children to be stigmatized. And so it goes. I had a very serious issue I, when I, 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 still, I still contend that, you know, just, just raping is, is terrible, but, you know, marrying of a child is worse. And, and marrying of a child can be supported right now. Rape, you can say that is a crime. But when you marry the person, uh, they can say that that is justifiable because that, that's what they believe. That's what the Sharia law, you know, dictates. So at the end of the day, it's not the same equivalence with somebody raping a child. So if you say the efficacy of the law, it doesn't apply here. See, you see, you are saying the same thing. You are, you are, you are trying to differentiate between uh, a child who is raped and a child who is married out, right? Now, but one is supported one, one, by a law. Now, now, if the criminal code says that if you sleep with an underage, by inference, it also prohibits that underage from being married. That is the law. But you have another law that supports it. Now, now, this one says that you can't give a child out in marriage. It depends on your own definition of who the child is. And the definition of the people who are talking about religion. You know, that is what I say. I don't want to go into that controversy. And so, your definition of who a child is, is probably somebody who from year one to after, by the criminal code, any person who is less than 18 is a child. Do you understand? But a lot of these people are being married out. You know, but the criminal code prohibits it. And so, it's not just about the Child Right Act. It's about the efficacy of the law. If, 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 if the law as it is now, presently constituted, 
being applied um, apply seriously of course some of these things will, will be addressed uh, will be addressed okay. but uh, we're not addressing it you know people talk about culture religion and our society and our mm. values what are our values you know so those are the issues uh, that, 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 uh, that okay. surround the whole of this uh, okay. problem that you are talking about uh, because rev, of time rev, rev yeah. is a monster i should be eradicated it's difficult to eradicate it but there should be laws that should be efficacious enough to deter people from, from, from uh, going even ahead contemplating it. rape. Absolutely. Yeah. Um, we're going to wrap up now because of time. So a couple more questions and then and then we'll be done. Um, care to weigh on the on the renovation of NAS, the NAS complex. <laughs> yes, I left this for now. L let's talk about that, sir. Um, COVID-19, a lot of people are out of jobs. You know, 30 million more people will be out of jobs according to the UN in Nigeria. I, 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 I ask Do you support every Nigerian it? that I should look at the budget now. There's nothing about renovation of the this in the has it been taken out totally yeah because it's, been, it's been taken out totally now yeah it's been taken out so okay. so you you see we're elected by people who are sensitive uh to 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 the uh, fears because of, the last the budget the, the first the the, the chairman uh the the the, the, the no, budget the, you see, he said it was 9.2 <clears throat> billion see, see see if we go to the national was reviewed assembly down. The, the unfortunate thing we have here is lack of maintenance that building was put together when I was in the when I was before I came to uh, National Assembly in 1999. I was in the House of Reps then. Now that building has not been maintained up to now. If we go into the chambers of the Senate, it leaks. If we go in there, the main chambers, it leaks. And this and this is not an ordinary building. The architecture is different. For it to be renovated, it's almost as if you are doing a new building. So it takes a lot of money. Whether the 37 billion that has been bandied about is adequate or not, is different. I'm not an architect, I'm not a building engineer. And so it is not even the National Assembly. This is done by FCDA. It's not we in the National Assembly giving the contract. These are bits of quantities that were submitted by architect and building engineers from FCDA. And so it is as if the National Assembly just sat down and came up with a figure. No, but because of the outcry, if we pick the budget of the National Assembly, there's nothing like 37 billion there for, for repairs of building. We've taken According the, to the budget office, it was reviewed down to 9.2 billion. No, we've taken the responsibility of that to FCDA. It is their responsibility to maintain the build that building and maintain the infrastructure of the National Assembly. We don't give contract, we are lawmakers. And so even the initial sum that has raised a lot of dust was sums that were submitted. I think the outcry by, by, was by, that by, why did you approve of it considering the period that we're in? It's like nobody's saying that you no, put wait, it there, wait. but it was the approval. Uh, would you rather have that you have elected people? who are in a building and that building collapse on them. Now, it wasn't us. The figures were predicated or based on base of quantities as submitted by engineers from FCDA. We don't have engineers who are into that. It's FCDA. We can't just sit down and say that, well, the repairs of this building is going to cause this. FCDA has the responsibility of maintenance of that building. Maintenance has not been done since 1999. That building is dilapidated. And one day you just have a situation where you have some part of it collapsing. God forbid that happens. But FCDA, if in their own wisdom, they have looked at it and said, we can scale this thing down. Well, I'm good because the entire capital project of the entire budget have been scaled down by about 20 or 30 percent. So it won't just be that National Assembly. All the capital projects have been scaled down, down because of the impact of COVID-19. And so people should, especially from journalists, when something like that come, who brought the base of quantities? Who brought it? It was FCDA. It's not National Assembly. No, we, we know that. Yeah. But, you know, but, but we also do know that it's up to the Senate to approve. You know, so so the, the so the outcry, just to explain it, it wasn't about the fact that the FCDA uh, brought if, it or if, that the place didn't need the maintenance. It was the if, fact that this is COVID-19. Uh, revenue is scarce. There are lots of things that need to be done. People are out of jobs. Is it very relevant right now to approve this amount 
of money to renovate the the NAS complex. That is the entire outcry. Not necessarily no, no, that no. you put it there. Why? 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 I agree. I'm one of those persons that believe that the the millions of youths out there should uh, be accommodated. Uh, sh- the, the the economic environment should be enabling enough uh, for them to engage in different endeavors. Jobs, white collar jobs are no longer there. So it is for it's, it is incumbent on government. And when I say government, government is inclusive of myself as a member of the National Assembly to create that enabling environment for our youth, for them to engage in different endeavors, not necessarily white collar jobs. Now, monies should be directed towards some of these uh, sectors. Yes, that is true. It is also true that if government have expended so much money on some of the gigantic buildings, they must be maintained. Look at the state of the National Secretariat. Are you happy as a Nigerian that you pass down it looking as if it's a place, uh, you know, it's just looking very rough because of lack of maintenance. And so if we allow a building to decay to that, and that is one of the buildings you see on NTA, it's one of the buildings that are highlighted in this country as a major uh, monument. Now it is not maintained. I'm not saying that I support the amount, but if that amount was the amount that engineers who are responsible for that felt that that was the money that was going to be enough for them to repair the building, I can't question it. For instance, Had, if, but you question the amounts that are brought to you. You do your no, due diligence. You investigate. No, no, we will do that, but they'll come to defend it, and they were there to defend it. For instance. I'm not a radio engineer. If I want to put up a radio station, and the engineer said that, well, this box is going to cost me 20 naira. And he, he comes to defend it. Because I have no knowledge of it, he will rely on his knows, expertise. I will rely on his expertise. And that is what we did. When they called the committee, saddled with that responsibility, called the engineers from FCDA, they were able to defend it. And if that committee was satisfied, we were satisfied. But having said that, that has been taken off because there have been so much outcry. And because of COVID, there's not enough money uh, for them to spend on that. So they are going to do the repairs in phases. Okay. It's no longer going to be a comprehensive repairs that will cover that uh, no, amount, that of that kind of amount of money. So it is now oh. being phased. So I believe that you are satisfied. <laughs> okay, last question. Can you weighing on what is going on in the APC? I know that, you know, that's for your party, but what are your thoughts? Well, you know, our democracy, instead of um, uh, being in hands, is retrogressing. It's unfortunate that people have little powers and they become timbers. Uh, it's very unfortunate. It's not just in, uh, in APC. That's happened across parties. It's unfortunate because there's no internal democracy. You can't. It's, it's unthinkable. It's, it's disgusting to me as a person that somebody who was screened by the same party to be governor has been governor for three years. Now the same party say that that person is disqualified on the basis of NYC certificate. It's very disgusting. It shows that we have no temperament for internet, uh, in internal democracy. And and we, we, we are, what we are showing was worse than the military that we are accusing that there is an aberration in, 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 a, in, a, in a polity. What, what is being done by by the political parties it's not something that was comprehended uh by the 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 uh, the, the people founding or the, the founding fathers or because how do you do that how so what happened the same person that you insulted that was a thief is the same person you are bringing back to your party and wanting to give him ticket this is a sitting governor a sitting governor it means that he was screened thoroughly, passed through the screening, and became elected. You woke up one day because you have misunderstanding with that person and say that that person has no qualification. It's unfortunate. I'm not supporting the governor because some of his attitude and behavior are undemocratic as well. But what has been done is not right. Yes, he has. He might be crossing over to your party. Are you are you happy about that? Well, I'm not aware of that. and uh, There have been reported uh, meetings and, with and, stakeholders, and, uh, the chairman of your party. You know, political parties are mere platforms. If you don't have this platform, you can go to this one. That is allowed within our constitution, freedom of association, under the fundamental human right. And so it is within his fundamental human right to 
avail himself of any, of any platform. Any platform. If PDP becomes a platform, so be it. But what I'm saying is that um, there must be internal democracy for this democracy that will practice for over 21 years to, 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 to survive. What we are headed to now doesn't look to me like we will survive in the next 10 years if this kind of attitude uh, from 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 practitioners will continue. Oh. It, this democracy, I don't think, uh, will survive. That sounds very grim. Let's hope. Let's hope not. Let's hope that we do survive. Thank you so much, distinguished Senator Gabriel Suswam, for coming on the show and for answering our questions and talking to us. Thank you very much for. The-